Thanks very much for uh, coming along today to get started at uh, 9 o'clock this morning after the first day yesterday. Information overload, no doubt, uh, after yesterday's sessions. I'm still sort of flying along after Dr. Lynn Kravitz's session yesterday on nutrient timing. If you've got a chance to go to that um, and you want to get buzzed up and hyped up, just go and see Len. I'm sure he'll do that for you. Today we're going to look at uh, a concept uh, which is fairly close to what I look at, which is strength nutrition. The notes for all of the sessions at, at Phylex are online. Uh, this year, so they're not, not actually handing out notes as such. So you need to get on uh, fitnessnetwork.com forward slash Phylex notes, I think it is, and you can find all the notes for all the sessions on there, which you can just download. All right, now, alternatively, if you have any trouble, you get on there, you can't find them, just send me an email, and I'll be more than happy to afford the, uh, the notes to you as we go. There's a lot of information that we're going to cover today. Yesterday, uh, Dr. Dr. Len done a great job in providing you with what we call the four W's. I'm going to add the plus H. So the four W's were what, where, when and why when he looked specifically at nutrient timing. Today what we're going to go through is a little bit of the why but more importantly the how. We're going to look at the mechanisms behind the science. A lot of this stuff you guys will know with regards to your currently training, you're, you're looking after different various athletes, you're looking at nutrient timing strategies. But what I want to do is hopefully my goal is to enhance academic inquiry. So what I want you to do today is not think about or reinforce what you know, but I want to give you a few points that hopefully you're unfamiliar with that you're going to take away with you and follow up more and more. First thing I want to do is just get a, a grading scale on a bit of a continuum with regards to our current knowledge. So who's currently uh, Cert 3, Cert 4? Okay, most people, great. Uh, undergraduate degree? Okay. Honours or Masters? PhDs? Good. Alrighty, fantastic. So we've got a, a varying scale with regards to the knowledge base that we have here. So we're going to look at working with you guys to try and enhance that. I use a few different learning strategies because my goal, as I said, is to enhance academic inquiry. So we're going to do some collaborative work with you guys in groups. So we're going to pass you off into, into sort of quarters. And if I can steal the terms from Dan Baker, who was a former strength coach with the Brisbane Broncos, we're going to portion you guys up in quarters, so you guys are going to be the gorillas. Sorry about that. Um, I'm sure Dan refers to that as the Ford pack. You guys at the back, you're going to be the cheaters. All right, so you're the speedy guys. You guys are the gazelles. You're very agile. Unfortunately, you guys are the extras. So you guys are the ones that usually have to do extra sessions because you need to change a different characteristic about your physical profile. We're going to work in those sort of four, four quarters as such when we do our collaborative learning tasks. What that will engage is you'll engage with the person next to you. Hopefully, you don't know the person next to you. You know, talk to them about some of the mechanisms and strategies that we present forward for you today. So with that in mind, the first thing I want to do is I'd like to obviously thank the, the Phylex Scientific Committee for allowing me to come and talk to you guys today and acknowledge uh, my affiliations with Charles Sturt University uh, in Bathurst. So it's about a three-hour drive from here, a little country town, and also Masashi Performance Nutrition, who we are looking after as regards to research profiles on the products that, that they supply. So firstly, just a little bit about uh, CSU. Offering awesome career opportunities, an exercise and sports science degree is your ticket to an exciting career working in a vast number of fields in Australia and all over the world. Careers in sport, such as working as a sports scientist, in strength and conditioning, working with elite athletes and professional teams. Your degree can also lead you to work in health, as an accredited exercise physiologist, in health and fitness as an exercise scientist, in corporate health, cardiac science, in occupational exercise science, or leading to further study opportunities, including research. All right, so that's a little bit of the place where, where I come from, from Charles Sturt University. Who's um, been to my presentations over the last couple of years? Anybody? Okay, so most of you haven't. Great, so there's no expectations, so I can sort of drill on about anything really and it, and it won't, won't affect you. Um, so various background, I left school when I was 15. Uh, school for me was an inconvenience to my sport. So what did Steve want to do? He wanted to be a rugby league superstar. All right, went down to Sydney when I was 17. Um, I had a couple of trials with, with Cronulla uh, in what they called then President's Cup, which was under 23s. So do the math, I was playing against guys who were six years older and bigger and stronger than me. So what happened to Steve? Obviously he got smashed. Uh, and my knee got twisted and folded about 90 degrees the wrong way, done an ACL, went back to Bathurst. Started working in the fitness industry in 1985. 
So now you're thinking, my goodness, how old is this guy? All right, I started working in the fitness industry when I was in year 10 at school. Uh, as soon as I finished uh, school, my main goal was to go back and do years 11 and 12 to be the youngest captain of the men's open football team. My mother thought that wasn't such a great idea to, um, to use that as my sole reason to go back to school, so she suggested I go get a job. I did work experience in a gym in 85 and then started working in a gym in 1986. So I've been working in the fitness industry the whole time. I've seen a lot of change from the gym industry point of view. When it was bodybuilders, boxers or martial artists who were the gym owners, there was lots of G-strings, leg warmers, leotards, all that sort of stuff. Now we've done the whole full circle and we have the health club environment where we have learned to swim for the kids, we have body shaping programs for mum, we have weights for, for dad. It's a whole family environment where we're looking at health and wellness. So there's been a whole circle of change. After working in the, in the, in the gym industry for 13 years, I applied for several jobs. My passion was strength and conditioning. I applied for jobs at N-Swiss at the AIS and received that lovely we regret to inform you letter because I didn't have a degree. So at that stage, my, my lovely wife Nina said, look, if you want to pursue this as a career, you need to either put up or shut up. Go to university and get a degree or pursue something else. So 13 years after I left school, I went to university. First lecture, three hours on the skull, Professor Frank Marino. Absolutely freaked me out. But I hung in there, got through the first, first semester, was fortunate enough to complete my undergraduate degree, got a few scholarships to do some honours and PhDs and a few, a few other things. But my point being is, for you guys doing Cert 3, Cert 4 now, once you finish that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of your education. You might decide to revisit and go back and look at further ed education at a later point. So certainly keep that in mind as, you, as you're going through. So with that in mind, we're looking at, at strength nutrition. One of, the, one of the job roles that I have at the moment is uh, Senior Advisor for the Elite Athlete Program in Indonesia. The athletes there have very um, different types of nutritional requirements and different requirements with, with their various needs. When you look at some of them with regards to their limitations for meat products, for example, we have a significant uh, issue come September with Ramadan where there's basically fasting through the daylight hours. So we need to look at supplementation strategies to allow my athletes to maintain their muscle mass and their strength expression. After September, there's October, November, then we have a main competition called the Southeast Asian Games, which is the main competition for Indonesia this year. So they go from a month of fasting, and then I have six to seven weeks to get them back to where they were so before we go into competition. So supplementation strategies become extremely important. So a few things we're going to cover today. We're going to look at outlining uh, strength and nutrition concepts. We're going to look at a central question proposed, proposed by Professor Hawley. We'll look at the nuts and bolts of this lecture, which is the pathway of adaptation model. That's going to provide us with the mechanisms and show you why different combinations of variant, uh, various nutrients actually promote the adaptive response, which is what we want for our athletes. We're going to have a look at what the research tells us and how that relates to this particular model. And then obviously we're going to um, summarise that as we get to the end. So firstly, from a practical standpoint, we know that there's three important concepts that are specifically related to the effectiveness of strength nutrition. Those being nutrient quantity, so i.e. What, uh, what kind of nutrients. Nutrient quality, so the types of nutrients that I'm going to consume. And nutrient timing, so the specific time periods when I'm going to uh, ingest my nutrition. These are impo very important considerations as their interactive effects significantly impact upon the effectiveness of strength nutrition. And predominantly today we're looking at enhancing gains through strength training. I'm not talking about a nu nutrient timing protocol for endurance. We want to try and optimise the acute response. And as we're going to see in a little while, it's the acute response to the the acute bout of exercise or the single bout of exercise, which is now deemed to be the most important factor to the chronic adaptive response. So, an expansive review by Professor Hawley in 2007 titled Innovations for Athletic Preparation, the Role of Substrate Availability to Modify Training Adaptations and Performance. This particular paper highlights the central question that we're going to try and answer today. That particular question is whether the acute transient changes in skeletal muscle protein turnover induced by nutrient manipulation translates into greater gains in lean muscle mass, exercise performance and muscle hypertrophy. So what does that mean? 
Well, that is to say, does strength nutrition enhance recovery from acute resistance exercise? And if I do that, will that promote chronic muscular adaptations? And the muscular adaptations that we're after for our athletes are obviously muscle growth and strength expression. If I can get those two areas, then hopefully I'm going to look at getting an improvement in exercise performance or sports performance. So how can we look at this particular question proposed by Professor Hawley? Now with that in mind, if we have a look at the research, and if you go to the Masashi website, all of these references will be listed on there. But what I want to highlight is recently there's been a greater research focus, and this has been placed on specific nutritional strategies. So things such as carbohydrate ingestion, protein, so both whole, food, whole foods such as milk and protein fractions, so things such as whey or casein, amino acids, so essential amino acids, as well as our branch chains, and different uh, nutrient combinations, so carbohydrate, amino acid or protein mixes. Now these particular strategies are most relevant to the quality, quantity and timing strategies we look at with nutrient, nutrient timing. And if you just do a quick search, over the past three years, there has been a significant amount of research that has actually looked at this particular quality, quantity and timing issue. And that's actually resulted in more than 30 scientific publications in the last three years. But most notably for you guys, there have been, that information has been taken by the International Society for Sports Nutrition. If you're not familiar with them, International Society for Sports Nutrition, just Google them. They have a lot of really good resources on their website, different PDF files, things that you can download and, uh, and send to your clients. But in 2008, the International Society for Sports Nutri Nutrition published the first ever position stand related to nutrient timing. The key point that they come up with this particular uh, position stand was that the timing of energy intake and the ratio of certain ingested macronutrients are likely attributes which allow for enhanced recovery, tissue repair following high intensity, high volume exercise, augmented muscle protein synthesis, and improved mood states when compared to unplanned or traditional strategies of nutrient intake. So if I look now at the time at which I take my my strength nutrition uh, processes, I can maximize some of these responses. You can uh, jump online. This position stands a free download paper. So get onto that International Society of Sports Nutrition. Uh, a lot of really good work on there that you can have a look at. So it sort of presents that, yes, there's a lot of research, as, as Dr. Kravitz alluded to yesterday. But now we've actually got a protocol we can follow that is published in a position stand. And what that has actually seen now is this interest in sports nutrition and supplementation has resulted in the publication recently of two very comprehensive textbooks. So feel free to try and, try and track these down through uh, Humana Press Springer. So Greenwood in 2009, as well as Half in 2008. But from my perspective, when I first got these two textbooks, I was really interested in my nutrient quality, quantity and timing processes for strength training specifically. So with that in mind, there were a couple of chapters in here which were really of significant interest to me. The first one by Jim Stepone, looking at nutritional needs of the strength and power athlete. And it goes on to provide a really good, concise overview of some of the arguments that we get presented with today. The main argument that we get when we start talking about strength nutrition is protein intake. Do strength athletes or endurance athletes require more protein than sedentary individuals? Do they need this 1.5 to 1.8 grams per kilo as opposed to the 0.8 for sedentary individuals? And they go through and show a lot of the reasoning behind why there is a need for higher protein intakes in, uh, in strength trained athletes. And the second, the second chapter specifically, nutrition before, during and after exercise for the strength and power athlete. This particular chapter goes on to show you exactly what to take and how to take it and is drawn from all the previous research to help us come up with our nutrient quality, quantity, and timing protocol. So with that in mind, I just briefly want to backtrack and just review what uh, Dr. Kravitz spoke about yesterday with regards to what is nutrient timing. 
we know that it influences the anabolic response to exercise. That's one process. But what I'm interested in from a research perspective is the other side of that stick. Yesterday, Dr. Kravitz said there was this interaction or this interplay between the anabolic process, the build-up, and the catabolic process, or the breakdown. What I'm interested in is the breakdown process. Can we reduce the amount of muscle breakdown that occurs? The argument has always been that I require breakdown to get build-up. We've all heard that before. What I'm saying is I think breakdown is the wrong word. We don't necessarily need to have great amounts of breakdown to get greater build-up. We need muscular disruption, so we need to disrupt the myofibrils and, and try and allow them to adapt to a new stimulus. But if we can reduce the amount of breakdown that actually occurs, that is going to provide us the catalyst for greater amounts of build-up. So if we look at muscle-wasting diseases, they have significant amounts of protein degradation or protein breakdown. Therefore, we get these huge losses in lean tissue. So from an athletic perspective, what I want to do, instead of taking my workout one step forward, in that next 48-hour period where my, my protein degradation is greatest, especially if I don't follow nutrient timing strategies, I take two steps back, I'm two steps behind where I was when I started. So if I can reduce the amount of muscle breakdown that occurs, I'm going to be in a better position to accrue more protein. So this window of opportunity, which was spoken about yesterday, this 45-minute period, which is critical immediately post-exercise. So with that in mind, what we want to try and do is look at, for me, four stages of nutrient timing. My pre. For me, that starts with my athletes on the way to the gym. So as soon as they leave the dorm or they leave the hotel, they start with their pre-exercise nutrition. My intra-workout or my during. So they'll consume nutrients throughout that time. And I feel from the research we've done, that is the most critical time during the workout. Because what usually happens during the workout? The person has a very high intensity exercise bout and they generally remain fasted unless they're consuming some type of sports drink. But ask most of the athletes and most athletes that I've dealt with in the past have, you know, drunk water. So they're at a time where their, their nutrient status is extremely compromised. So during the workout is extremely important. Immediate post-workout, definitely. I can try and augment glycogen um, resynthesis straight away. And then my late post-workout. So after that sort of 45 minutes to two hour period when I then want to ingest some whole foods. So your supplementation strategies allow you pre, during and immediate post due to ease of consumption. And then my late post, I will look at my whole, my whole, food, whole food ingestion. So to maximize what we're going to look at doing is ingesting small mixes of amino acids pre, during, and post training. So small mixes, anywhere from sort of six to eight to 10 grams. Uh, six grams is generally the, the, uh, the number that's been thrown about. So I can look at lean body mass, one arm strength, and muscle growth was greater with ingestion pre compared to post resistance exercise. A really nice paper that we're gonna have a look at in a little bit, in a little bit of time by, uh, by Dr. Krubes and colleagues. And some work that we did recently, we looked at liquid carbohydrate amino acid ingestion during the exercise bout. And this maximized the hypertrophy response compared to either carbohydrates or amino acid ingestion independently. And we'll have a look at that particular study in a little while as well. So two key studies, one looking at pre versus post, one looking at during. So two of our main times for our nutrient ingestion. Now, this I said earlier on, I want to promote academic inquiry. I want you to think a little bit liberally about some other areas. Three things that that Dr. Kravitz spoke of yesterday, three key terms he presented. One was metabolic sensitivity. Two was nutrient activation. And finally was nutrient optimization. I think they're three key terms that we can use with our clients or our athletes to try and get them to visualize this concept of nutrient timing. Metabolic sensitivity, nutrient activation, nutrient optimization. Give those terms some thought. How can I use those in my everyday talking with my client? <coughs> so, with that in mind from Dr. Travitt's talk yesterday, nutrient timing promotes recovery and improving muscle integrity through three distinct, distinct phases. 
He spoke about the energy phase, so the pre, the anabolic phase, the during and immediately post, and then the growth phase in the late, the late post. But with these three areas, it is those three key terms which I'm most interested in. Of those three, the, the metabolic sensitivity, the nutrient activation, and the nutrient optimization. Where do they fit into my energy phase, my anabolic phase, or my growth phase? So think about those three terms. I think they're quite useful for us to help get our, our clients to visualize this concept of nutrient timing. All right, so with that in mind, this is the research, some of the research by um, Dr. Cribbs. He highlights two key points related to nutrient timing. Research indicates greater muscle hypertrophy with resistance training following nutrient timing, specifically protein and carb ingestion before and or after a workout. And that nutrient timing represents a simple but effective strategy that enhances the adaptations desired from resistance training. Now, if we look at the previous work by Professor Tipton in this particular area where he looked at pre and post ingestion, they found that pre ingestion was more optimal compared to just post ingestion. And the reason for that is with the pre ingestion, I've got the ingestion of the, of the, the substrate, so in this instance protein, it gets digested. I start my exercise bout, after about 30 to 45 minutes, those amino acids are primed and available to be transported. Throughout the exercise bout, my blood flow increases. I get a, a vasodilation response with regards to some of the hormones that, that kick in, so epinephrine, norepinephrine with my acute exercise bout. I get greater blood flow. I get greater transportation of the amino acids. Now, the other key with regards to that's the first part, the transportation. The next part for the amino acids is the utilization. What's the missing link between those two? One of the key hormones that Dr. Krupp spoke about yesterday. Insulin. It's the gatekeeper to the cell. So without an insulin, an increase in insulin, my amino acids won't be you know, readily taken up by the cell. So now if I add some small amounts of high glycemic carbohydrates to the mix, I can start to get an increase in insulin as well. Well, the theory is based on 20 years of research. One of the things that we find, found out as exercise physiologists is that when um, the body goes through an exercise protocol, we can need nutrients within a certain time. So when we exercise, the rate at which we can digest carbohydrates, proteins, amino acids is much greater than times when we don't exercise. Also, our muscles are very sensitive are more sensitive to uh, these nutrients and insulin and all these other hormones that are involved in the recovery aspect. So we can actually accelerate the recovery, glycogen, augment the anabolic effects of our training and reduce the catabolic effects, these hormones that are released from the stressful exercise that can actually tear your muscle down. And all of these things are much more sensitive um, at the time of exercise. And if you supply the right nutrients, it sets up a, an environment that actually enhances your training over time. All right, so that's the first part we're going to look at. So we're going to segment and chunk our presentation today. The first part looking at nutrient timing. So now is our first learning strategy. I want you to explain to your partner, we use a concept called 90 60 30. So what I want you to do is to explain to your partner as much as you can about nutrient timing in 90 seconds. Your partner then needs to gather that information and regurgitate it back to you in 60 seconds. Then you need to condense it even further, pulling out the most important bits, spit it back to them in 30 seconds. All right, you guys are on the job. Don't forget, gorillas, cheetahs, gazelles, extras. 90 seconds, away you go.
Okay, 60 seconds. Change it over, 60 seconds, spit it back. Okay, 30 seconds, last bit, as much as you can get into them. Let's go. Time. Beautiful. 90, 60, 30. Synthesize the most important bits, throw out the junk, then repeat it back. Gorillas. Nutrient timing. What do you got? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's something. <laughs> four stages. Beautiful. So I've got four, four steps in it or four stages. Very good. And... Great, so I've got pre, during, immediate post, and late post. Fantastic. Dr. Kravitz, three phases he said, yeah? Which were? All right, so if you can think of those key terms, and associate that with your nutrient timing, you'll do really well. Now, where did that come from? Just here, was it? You score. Ah, oh, well, she's got the power bar, the, um, the, the bar there, so you better look out. All right, so think about nutrient timing with regards to those concepts. Fantastic. We're going to move on. All right, so let's get back to our central question. Okay, as we said at the start, Professor Hawley proposed one really important question when I had to start looking at the literature. So whether the acute transient increases in skeletal muscle protein turnover induced by nutrient manipulation during recovery between training sessions translates into greater lean muscle mass, hypertrophy and strength in performance. So if I manipulate the nutritive status of my, of my training session with pre, during, post or immediate post, late post, will I get greater improvements in the adaptive response. So what I want to look at is the pathway of adaptation model. So this is a central model now to those four phases or four stages that we touched on in nutrient timing. Professor Volick, this particular paper, Medicine, Science, Sport and Exercise, Influence of Nutrition Responses Through Resistance Training, a really good paper that presents a specific model that now starts to explain some of these phenomena that actually occur. What he provides is a practical representation with regards to the strength and nutrition concept that mediate acute changes to resistance exercise and the chronic adaptation. Sequence of events deemed responsible for skeletal muscle growth and improved strength expression. And he goes on to highlight here specifically the key point is the four key steps in the acute response. I mentioned earlier on, there's a lot of research coming out now that is saying it's the acute response to the single training bout which is most critical to my long-term adaptive response. These four steps in the acute response are what go to mediate my adaptation to my exercise. So with that in mind, if we look at this, this was the, the paper that we had published in the Network Magazine on Strength Nutrition. We highlight these four specific areas in the acute response. So we look at nutritional supplementation. Okay, we look at resistance exercise. We look at the hormone response. And then we look at the molecular machinery. Now we're going to touch on each of these particular acute responses to see how they translate 
or why they translate into greater chronic adaptations. And our chronic adaptation is my muscle strength and performance, and then my muscular hypertrophy and lean body mass. So these things go around. Now what I'm interested in specifically is how do I promote these particular responses? Because what I want to do is I want to take that and turn it into that over time. I can maximize this with my nutrient timing concept. So, buckle up because the mechanisms are about to come into play. So the first thing is the pathway adaptation model defines the interaction of four key steps in the acute response to the exercise bout. The first key step is obviously resistance exercise and nutritional intake. As previously mentioned, recently a greater research focus has been placed upon specific nutritional strategies such as liquid carbohydrate, protein and amino acid ingestion, centered around the acute exercise bout itself. We want to try and initiate some of the key signals responsible for protein synthesis and getting an increase in the anabolic build-up phase. And we want to try and de-switch or turn down some of the key signals for protein degradation or the breakdown of muscle. But interestingly for me, when I first looked into this whole concept, there was a lot of research on pre and post nutrition. But there wasn't very much research on nutrition during or that the intra workout. So we specifically looked at setting out some research profiles on that particular component. So first we know that carbohydrate ingestion reduces muscle glycogen loss associated with exercise and we know that especially if I have repeated training. So if we have athletes that do two or more or multiple training sessions a day there can be up to 40 to 60 percent reduction in, in, in glycogen loss from the first session to the second session. Secondly, we know that if I look at, pardon me, if I look at carbohydrate ingestion from a hormonal perspective, that I can get a suppression in the cortisol response during a resistance exercise bout. So Professor um, Cole Tarpening looked at this response specifically and showed that with a small ingestion of a, a liquid glycemic carbohydrate, and in this particular study, they just ingested a Gatorade. They had a significant suppression of the cortisol response and a significant increase in the insulin response. Then finally, with regards to, to protein or amino acid ingestion, supplementation of protein ingestion before and or after resistance exercise has an additive effect on protein synthesis. But what Professor Tipton looked at was if the protein was ingested prior to the exercise bout, it was a more significant response than if it was ingested just after the exercise bout. And then finally, some research has suggested that the addition of protein to carbohydrates can enhance glycogen storage. So there's some significant research that has gone looking at that pre, so the first step in my nutrient timing strategy. Then we know along with those, the ingestion of the, the macronutrients, we get a release of endocrine hormones. And there's a few there which we've already touched on yesterday by Dr. Kravitz. So insulin, IGF-1, testosterone, growth hormone, obviously there's some, some cytokine release as well as cortisol. The main two looking for myself and my research I'm interested in is the antagonistic relationship between insulin and cortisol. How does that affect promoting muscle growth and strength expression. We know that cortisol plays a key role in protein remodeling. And specifically, it, it breaks down the contractile proteins, releases them so they can go to the liver for gluconeogenesis purposes, to resynthesize glucose and glycogen. So if I'm training, one of the responses I don't want is to break down more muscle. Yes, I need muscular disruption, but I don't want to actually necessarily break down more protein from a muscular point of view. Furthermore, leading authority in this area is obviously Professor Will Kramer from Ball State University. A key paper published some 20 years ago actually looked at the hormonal mechanisms involved in homeostatic control and long-term cellular uh, adaptations to strength training. 
Now, more recently, Professor Kramer and Nicholas um, Radimus looked at a paper titled Hormonal Responses and Adaptations to Resistance Exercise and Training, published in Sports Medicine. This paper suggested that the acute response to training, so the acute change in the hormonal profile, is much more critical for tissue growth and remodeling compared to other, other times. So if I can get an acute response or an acute change in my status from a nutritional point of view and a hormonal point of view, I can significantly get greater adaptations in training. Now this is more critical than just long-term changes in basal or resting hormonal profiles. Because we know with training, as I become more accustomed to the stress, my cortisol levels actually decrease. But what that does is give me a greater range to get a peak. What I want to try and do is minimise the peak in cortisol responses specifically. So the second phase, alteration of nutrient and hormonal profiles. We know that manipulation of the acute program variables from a strength training perspective will affect the acute hormonal response and that the influence of nutrient manipulation on exercise-induced hormones is really misunderstood. In this particular paper, we put forward a profile of how you manipulate the acute training variables. As personal trainers or strength and conditioning coaches, we're all vying for the same target market. Your ability to identify and manipulate acute training variables is what will set you apart from the person next to you. So how do I manipulate those acute training variables to get long-term adaptations in my program? Because in the first six to eight weeks of the program, we can pretty much get our clients to do anything and they're going to get some type of response. But if we have that patient or that client for six months or 12 months, we need to be able to change those acute training variables quite readily. Now the other portion to this is some research from our, our laboratory specifically looking at changing the acute, pro, um, acute program variables and the hormonal response based on carbohydrate and amino acid ingestion. We showed in untrained men that carbohydrate and or amino acid ingestion during a resistance exercise resulted in suppression of the exercise induced cortisol response. So we actually can get a reduction in cortisol during the exercise bout. Therefore, we propose that such an environment would be more conducive for potential protein accretion and muscle building. Now, keep in mind this was with untrained individuals. We've replicated this work in trained individuals and had the same response. So it doesn't appear to be that the, the training status of the individual is the main determinant. That will influence the magnitude of the response from a hormonal perspective, but we still got a suppression in cortisol response in trained individuals following carbohydrate amino acid ingestion. Finally, once again, if we look at the work by Kramer, he looked at ingestion of a multi-nutrient supplement. And what he showed with this was that it had a, uh, a potential to increase growth hormone and testosterone and IGF-1 responses. So now there's an interplay between other nutrients that may be linked together in actually enhancing the hormonal profile following resistance exercise. So collectively, if we look at these four studies, they indicate that the exercise hormonal response can be influenced by nutrient interventions and can be influenced by a way that promotes the cellular adaptations. So getting increases in what we'd like to do, which is strength expression and possibly muscle gain. And this, we know that these responses are absolutely mediated at the, the receptor level within, within the cell. So if I can reduce the amount of muscle breakdown, I can maximise the number of receptors that are available, I can decrease cortisol, increase insulin, get that interaction to occur, promoting some of the molecular pathways that go to build new proteins for the body. So if we look at some of the hormonal responses, so there are obviously several that we're looking at with regards to my before, during, and after nutrition. Several glands that help secrete the various hormones that I'm interested in, insulin, growth hormone, IGF-1, cortisol, testosterone, and estrogen. With that in mind, I know that all of these hormones have different cellular responses, what they're trying to promote. But at the end of the day, there's really three responses that I'm interested in from a training perspective. I'm interested in my fuel selection during exercise, we know that my nutrient status becomes compromised when I train. 
so I need to top it up during the exercise bout. I'm interested in the glycogen um, replenishing. So what I want to do is immediately post-exercise start getting increases in glycogen buildup for the next exercise bout. And ultimately, protein synthesis. You can increase in protein synthesis and a decrease in protein breakdown. All right, so continuing on, alteration of the nutrient hormonal milieu from that last paper. With regards to increased amino acid and glucose uptake, there's a couple of things going on here. There's an important role with regards to the controlling mechanisms with these two particular areas. We know that protein ingestion um, from whole foods itself or supplementation and amino acid administration, either intravenously or orally, can both enhance the anabolic profile, resulting in protein synthesis. However, following acute bound of resistance exercise, we know that the rates of protein synthesis and protein breakdown are both elevated. And significantly for us, protein breakdown becomes the dominant factor over the next 48 hours following the acute exercise bout. So if I don't follow any nutrient timing strategies, my net protein balance, I'm going to have a loss. So that period post-exercise over 48 hours becomes extremely important. So in view of this, research from Langenhaven and colleagues from Vanderbilt University indicates that without amino acid ingestion, protein synthesis is limited due to reductions in the availability of amino acids. Okay, so if I have limitations due to the availability, if I can supplement in my pre-ingestion, 30 to 40 minutes into the workout, those amino acids become available. I have a little bit of carbohydrates in there to give me an insulin increase, which opens up the gateway. I now can get amino acids coming into the cell. Furthermore, the authors of this particular paper said that more importantly, the availability of energy for post-exercise repair is not as important as just the availability of amino acids themselves. So it's not so much just an increase in energy, it's specifically an increase in the availability of amino acids. Because we know in the absence of, of amino acids itself, insulin only has a moderate, moderate effect on protein synthesis. So insulin by itself is not the key regulator. There needs to be some amino acids present. So therefore, supplying small doses of aminos centered around or near the time of exercise is going to maximize the insulin response as well as promoting a greater environment for the expression of, of new muscle proteins. Finally, with that in mind, a recent paper by Manum suggests that with post-exercise hyperinsulinemia as well as hyperaminoacidemia, so getting increase in insulin, increase in amino acids, induced by protein and or leucine, remember that key branch chain amino acid, net protein depositation in the muscle will occur. So if we looked here specifically at altering the hormonal response through carbohydrate protein ingestion, opening up the gateway, allowing amino acids into the cell, the antagonistic relationship between insulin and cortisol. Alrighty, think, pair, share. So last time we did 90, 60, 30. Well, this time, all we're doing is think, pair, share. What I want you to do with your partner now is to discuss steps one and step two in that particular model. So the first step was during the exercise bout having my ingestion. The second step was getting an alteration in the hormonal environment through the ingestion as well. All right, steps one and step two. With your partner, two minutes, quick time for a chat about those two profiles.
Okay. Gorillas are done. They looked after our nutrient timing. Cheetahs. Somebody from the cheetah group. Let's go. Steps one and two. Tell me something about them. Step one. What do we want to happen in step one? Yeah, that's going to be our outcome. Definitely. That's what we want as our chronic response. But what do we want to do first up in step one? We want to? Absolutely. We want to ingest something. Okay, carbohydrates, protein. We want to ingest that. What are the two main responses we want from the ingestion? We want to get changes in two things. Yeah, definitely. So I want a hormonal response. All right, and then what do I want to try and improve as a, as a substrate? Yeah, definitely. So I want to get protein responses as my outcome here. But if I'm doing multiple bouts a day? Yeah, energy. So here, if I look at glycogen, so I want to try and get a hormonal response that promotes getting increases in glycogen for energy and substrate availability. Fantastic. So that's my nutrient intake. Now, alteration of hormones. What do we got? Hit me. Great. Very good. Somebody's listening. Fantastic. Insulin and cortisol. Why are we interested in those two hormones, primarily? Fantastic. So, we know that with insulin, where'd that come from? Hand up. Okay, so we know, good catch. So we know that insulin's going to help open up the, the, um, the gateway for amino acids to move in, and cortisol is going to degrade my fibro proteins, break them down to their amino acid constituents, send them to the liver so I can resynthesize more glucose and glycogen. So that, don't really want. I want to try and suppress that response. So for the first two steps, it's about hormonal changes and helping to try and increase the energy state for the exercise bout, alteration of my hormones, primarily interested in insulin and cortisol. Absolutely. Indeed. Indeed. Such a simple thing to do. Why weren't we doing it sooner? You probably were. I'm probably the slow uptake. All right. So, gorillas, cheetahs, good. Gazelles, you guys better start listening. Unfortunately, you get the uh, molecular stuff, so <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> yeah, indeed. All right, so we know that in step three, moving on now, so we've got steps three and four. Step three, nutrient and hormonal uptake and interaction with contraction-induced mechanical and chemical events. So as I get a mechanical event, there's going to be some type of chemical reaction. Some of those chemical reactions and some of the enzymes may be present that aid with the inflammatory process, that aid with, with leakage of muscle damage or indicators of muscle damage, such as CK. If we look first at... How do I get changes in the molecular response? So a paper by Professor Tipton once again, a recent paper last year, highlights that the combination of resistance exercise and nutrition is a potent anabolic stimulator. Through getting increases in muscle protein synthesis, okay, with amino acids themselves, and getting decreases in muscle protein breakdown by ingesting your carbohydrates. So that's the first thing. We've got that interaction between muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein breakdown. How I can manipulate and swing that based on my nutrient manipulation. And then the second point he makes in, a, in another paper published in 2008 as well is that nutritional manipulation focused on prevention of protein degradation, muscle damage, and oxidative stress. So those three key indicators can all be influenced. Specifically, if I look at changing my nutrient manipulation. So the process is critical, obviously, for optimal adaptive responses. So what we want to try and do is we want to maximise the bang for the buck for the athlete in that session or the client in that session. We want to have the most productive session available in the acute session. We want to maximise their recovery so we can bring them back and do the same thing again. So, coming to the nuts and bolts of it. If we look first up at... Um, a very interesting paper by Levino and colleagues in 2005 from Italy. They showed that the anabolic properties of branch chain, in particular leucine, have been known for many years. But only recently have we actually started to get a handle on their molecular properties. So what it is at a molecular level that goes on to give us this increase in 
uh, in, in strength expression and, and, and obviously protein itself. So amino acids, branch chains, so leucine, isoleucine and valine in particular, not only provide substrates for protein synthesis, but are now recognised to be regulators of some of the key primary enzymes related to protein synthesis. Okay, but more for me, protein degradation. So if you're going to go and buy anything, make sure it's got leucine in it. It is the key, the key modulator for protein synthesis and protein degradation. Maximise synthesis, decrease degradation. A lot of research been on, on leucine. So of the branch chain, leucine is the most potent with its effects. Um, and it's the most physiologically relevant when I look at trying to get these particular responses. So for my guys in their pre-workout, okay, they'll have a high glycemic carb drink, okay, and we have two to three grams of leucine in it before they go and train. All right, so now if we get further on into the, uh, into the cell itself, so now we're looking at the enzyme activity to try and promote this genetic response. A key particular paper here looked at branch chain ingestion in vivo and proposes that mTOR, okay, mammalian target of rapamycin, all you need to know is mTOR, is the most important nutrient and energy signaling pathway for skeletal muscle. And surprise, surprise, that particular pathway is significantly influenced by leucine. And some of the downstream signals that result in new protein formation from a, um, a skeletal muscle growth point of view are related to this particular pathway. So protein synthesis is suggested to be mediated in part by changes in muscle signaling properties. So we know one signal is the stimulus, the exercise bout. Okay, the next signal is the nutritive signal, which gets deep further within the muscle. mTOR itself leads to uh, phosphorylation of, of several key enzymes, which actually promote the growth of new tissue. So, specifically three key areas. One is the acute increase in nutrient and in insulin availability. No good having an increase in insulin unless I've got an increase in amino acids. Of the amino acids, leucine is the most important one and has been suggested to be more important than insulin as a regulator of muscle growth. And then finally, if I look at combined ingestion, so combined ingestion of both carbohydrates and protein, once again, leucine-enriched amino acid carbohydrate drink was shown to increase muscle protein synthesis by about 145%. Okay, so a huge increase. Whereas an increase of only 41% was measured in those subjects who performed the exercise bout without any nutrition. So some pretty compelling evidence here that looks at the enzymatic activity related to mTOR. And that particular pathway is stimulated by leucine. All right, so that's the third step. So you need to take a couple of things away from step three. mTOR, leucine. Got it? Great. All right, step number four. So now we look at... Get, oh, we'll come back here. All right, so now we look specifically at the moving into the chronic adaptive response. Now, for me, if I look at my chronic adaptations, what I'm interested in specifically is not the ability to maximise protein synthesis per se, but my interest is the ability to reduce protein degradation or muscle breakdown. Now, that can be for my athletes. It can obviously be for my chronic condition patients that we work with in the clinic as well. But suffice to say, it's the nutrient status of the patient or the athlete at that moment of time in the exercise bout that I can significantly influence. And that's going to ultimately further promote increases in chronic adaptations. So an increase in catabolic activity, and this paper was a groundbreaking paper quite a few years ago, that actually proposed that an increase in catabolic activity is a component that can be seen that is um, optimi or not optimising the muscle growth response. So he goes on to suggest that Muscle protein breakdown is not a, a huge component of the muscle build-up response. Yes, we need myofibrillar disruption, but no, we don't necessarily need to increase muscle breakdown. However, there is little known regarding hormonal regulation of this until a few years ago, where we really looked at the influence of cortisol on that particular response. Considerable evidence indicates that there's a particular pathway responsible 
for the breakdown of muscle protein actinomycin. And that particular pathway is called ubiquitin. There's a lot of enzymes involved in ubiquitin that go on to tag muscle proteins to direct them to the barrel to be broken down. So there's several evidence that actually has really highlighted what the pathway is for muscle breakdown. A review by Hamill and colleagues in 2004 suggested that amino acids and hormones, specifically my glucocorticoids, so cortisol, uh, control the expression of the components for that ubiquitin pathway. So now if I can start to link, if I can suppress cortisol, I can actually control some of the components or the enzymatic activity that control muscle breakdown. And then we also know that resistance exercise can result in hypersecretion of cortisol. In one of the first studies we did um, when we looked at this, we got a, you know, 16 or 18 young guys in a pilot study who were untrained, gone to do a, a whole body resistance training workout, 60 second rest periods between sets. They did eight exercises, three sets of each, 24 sets in about 35 minutes. All right. I was lucky my wife was there because she was running around with the garbage because these guys were just throwing up everywhere. It was that intense for them. These guys had readings of cortisol that were above 800 nanomole, which is huge, a huge response. So we know that resistance exercise in us is going to result in a huge spike in this. Even in training guys that we have in the gym, I'm getting readings of sort of six to 800. Okay, because cortisol is intensity dependent, remember. The higher the intensity, the greater the response is going to be. So with that in mind, we know that with, with Willoughby specifically, he looked at some of the events that result in muscle breakdown. And he said there's a cascade of events that revolve around cortisol. And those events are upregulation of the ubiquitin components. So he suggests a potential role for glucocorticoids in mediating the exercise response from a muscle breakdown point of view. So if we can reduce the amount of cortisol, can we get reductions in protein degradation and muscle breakdown? So this has far greater implications than just what we're doing with our athletes. So with that in mind, recently we investigated the effects of liquid carbohydrate and amino acid ingestion um, on untrained guys looking specifically at myofibular protein degradation. So how much muscle breakdown actually occurred. And we showed that it actually can, if we can suppress cortisol, we can get reductions in um, 3 methylhistidine, one of the amino acids that's used as an indicator for muscle breakdown. So the results indicate that not only does carbohydrate or amino acid ingestion during the exercise bout suppress exercise-induced cortisol response, okay, but the stimulatory effect of resistance exercise can also be overcome. So even though they're doing a high-intensity exercise bout, we can actually get reductions in, in cortisol. So this was, um, when we looked at the 3 histidine, those guys that had the carbohydrate and amino acid ingestion only had an increase of 27%, or had 27% reduction in 3 methylhistidine, the guys that had the placebo had a 56% increase. So there was a significant difference in what happened with regards to one group getting a decrease in 3 methylhistidine, another group getting an increase. So through an anti-catabolic effect, we basically went on to say that we can reduce the amount of muscle, break, muscle breakdown by suppressing cortisol with a carbohydrate essential amino acid mix. Now our research has turned more focused onto just the branch chains, and specifically centering some of our research around um, leucine. So collectively, these reports imply a link between ubiquitin, cortisol, carbohydrate, amino acid ingestion, and how they are all related to reduce muscle breakdown. If I can reduce muscle breakdown, then obviously I can improve recovery. I can improve recovery, I can get the athlete back into training again the next day. We also have the added benefit with the reductions in cortisol, helping to maintain immune function in my athletes. So when repeated, these results often result in downregulation of some of that ubiquitin pathway components. So there's actually a mechanism related to that. All right, with that in mind, there's two papers recently that have actually had a look at protein um, degradation and resistance exercise and the hormonal interactions. Now, of these two particular papers, they basically go on to show that if, if I have a, a post-exercise cortisol concentration is the only marker that they looked at that was actually related to um, androgen receptor content. So the more cortisol there was, the greater availability for um, these receptors to actually interact. 
And what they showed was in those that uh, had supplementation that there were greater amounts of androgen receptors to interact with, with anabolic hormones because there was a reduction in muscle breakdown. The more muscle breakdown there was, the less receptors were available. The less muscle breakdown, the more receptors were available. So basically they went on to, to show that supplementation post-exercise actually increased androgen receptor content. So there was more receptors available if they had some supplementation because there was a less amount of protein degradation that actually occurred. All right, so back to this particular model. So what we're interested in now is this interplay between protein synthesis and protein degradation. We all know about the synthesis. Yes, I can get an increase in th synthesis and get a build-up. But I can further promote that, maximise it, if I get a reduction in protein degradation. So that's what we're trying to do. So with that in mind, when we look at examining the effects of amino acids specifically, once again, Professor Tipton showed that ingesting 40 grams of essentials resulted in a change from net muscle balance from negative to positive. The authors then suggest that hyperamino acidemia from ingestion of amino acids was effective in maximising the resistance training response. He also showed that ingestion of just the essentials was required because um, there were similar responses with mixed amino acid ingestion and essentials. So now they're looking at the essential uh, ingestion itself. Additional research examining this with the effect of carbohydrates uh, during recovery showed the same, same results. So the authors concluded that the ingestion of carbohydrates after resistance exercise promoted further increases in, uh, in protein synthesis due to reductions in protein breakdown. So collectively, these studies highlight the importance of strength nutrition from a carbohydrate and amino acid ingestion perspective. So back to this concept that we looked at in the paper we published earlier on. How does it all fit together? So we know that the hormonal events play a huge role, and it's specifically we want to look at insulin and cortisol. We want to look at nutrient intake to try and promote and optimise those particular hormones themselves. And it's the combination of these which is quite, quite important. We've already looked at my mTOR pathway. So I get some branch chains coming in, come along and affect mTOR, some downstream signals result in greater translation initiation, greater protein synthesis. Key here for this is leucine from a protein synthesis perspective. But I'm interested, as I said, in the breakdown. So here's my ubiquitin pathway. So, so that my fibre becomes damaged. Okay, certain enzymes, E1, 2, and 3, come into play. They tag onto the protein. They get into the chain. They become ubiquinated. They come down to the S26 barrel. The myofibril goes in there, and then it spits out amino acids. So this is my anabolic pathway for protein synthesis. This is my catabolic pathway for protein degradation. So now I've linked it to two specific pathways. So with that in mind, we know that ultimately I've got this interplay. Protein synthesis, protein degradation. Two particular pathways that are optimal. All right, final step. Steps three and four. Two minutes. I want to talk about the interplay between the pathways and the ingestion of your, your macronutrients, carbohydrates, and amino acids. Okay, where you go. Nutrient uptake, mechanisms for the genes themselves.
Okay. Gazelles, you guys scored. No, my, my theory by giving this to Gazelles, you guys sort of look like the most knowledgeable when you walked in, so I thought I'd give this part to you guys. All right, step three and step four. Tell me something about them. Step three, what are we looking to try and do? This is where you get to impress me with all your knowledge so far that you've learned. Yep. Great. So here I'm looking at some post-nutrition, whether it's carbs or aminos, and we'll discuss some other options later. What are we trying to influence here? Yeah, so I want to get an influence on the hormones, which are going to affect what? Protein synthesis, good, through some of the molecular pathways. So this gives me a response here. What are the, the two pathways? mTOR, great. Great, so I've got ubiquitin for that one, mTOR for that one. So now I've actually got a mechanism that shows how it's going. Now, where'd that come from? Big fella there, wasn't it? Oh. Indeed. Did anyone else say something? Where was it? Someone else said mTOR here? Oh, oh you're kidding me, aren't you? I won't be able to throw it all the way down there. I'll crack somebody in the head. I don't think the insurance covers that. Indeed. mTOR and ubiquitin. There you go. You're welcome. All right, so a lot of steps in the particular pathway to try and promote this increase in protein synthesis degradation. So that's the acute response. All of that happens in one session. All of that's going on when I go and do my 24 sets or whatever I'm doing. Now I want to look at the chronic response because we don't forget we said it's the accumulative effect of all of the acute responses that ultimately give me the greatest increase in protein synthesis uh, and strength expression. So what I'm interested in is this repeated acute response, so the chronic training. How do I get chronic increases in changes in the, my muscle profile state? So what we know is that with the chronic adaptation, we're looking at the repeated bout effect. We actually looked at a study where we got the guys to do 12 weeks of training. We did our intra-workout supplementation strategies to see what would happen long term. There's a lot of studies that looked at acute abouts, but not so many that have actually looked at long term. In this particular paper, we had 32 untrained guys. They did 12 weeks of training. Um, so the same thing. They did uh, their 24 sets. They had about, on average, 675 mils of, of fluid. One group had a 6% carb solution. One group had a... 6 gram amino acid mix, third group had the combined, and these poor guys got dirty water. Um, <laughs> not that we told them that. All right, we, we measured a truckload of stuff. We looked at a lot of hormones, we looked at markers for muscle breakdown, we looked at um, uh, muscle biopsy, we looked at body composition scans, we've done a heap of stuff, as well as obviously doing some dietary analysis on these guys. So the first thing we looked at was changes in um, their DEXA profile. Yep. For this one, we only looked at, at type, type 1 and, uh, and type 2, and then we break type 2 into 2A and 2X. Okay, and we'll touch on that in a second. Um, with our body composition, so we just give them a DEXA body scanner. So everyone's done sort of underwater weighing before, probably, or skin folds. The gold standard is having a body scan done. And what you'll notice here is that, surprisingly, from a body mass perspective and a, a fat-free mass, that my carbohydrate amino acid group was significantly greater than placebo and that independently, carbohydrate and or amino acids almost mirrored one another. But when I put the two things together, I seem to get this synergistic effect or this, this bigger response. Not much happened from a fat reduction point of view. There was nothing significant happening there. But there was with regards to body mass and, and fat-free mass. From a muscle biopsy point of view, um, best fun. If you do a muscle biopsy on someone, you've got to do it. It's great. Love it. Um, as long as they don't do it on me, it's all right. So we make a small incision. We get a, a Bergstrom biopsy needle, which is about as thick as your pen, 5 mil Bergstrom biopsy needle. Um, and, and actually, what was really cool, we kept playing the jokes on these guys, and we, we'd give them the anaesthetic, and then we say, oh, it's, a, it's a trial to see if, if, there's, um, if this placebo anaesthetic actually does anything. So you guys, and they were freaking out. It was really good. Um, so we stick the needle in, and we pull out this little tiny piece of snot, I mean um, muscle, all right, really, really small bit. We then freeze it, okay, and then we go, everyone's been to Coles, and you know the deli slicer, all right, just a real fancy one of those. And then we slice off a very small piece, uh, which is about 6 to 8 UM. A strand of hair is about 24. So it's about three times as thin as a strand of hair. Um, 
Then we stain it, then we look for some chemical reactions, and then we get different colours. All right, so pretty easy process, really, to come up with this. Now, what happens here is we're looking at changes in cross-sectional area for type 1, 2A, and, and 2X. Once again, when they consume the carbohydrates or amino acids independently, the, uh, the response was almost similar. But when they had them together, you can see we had a 23%, 27%, and 20% increase in size in those cross-sectional areas of the fibre. So what we do to get this is we put this underneath some software and we actually trace around, or that, the machine actually traces around and tells us the diameter of each fibre. So that's how we work out um, changes in cross-sectional area. All right, then the last one, which was the greatest one, um, was 3-methylhistidine. So 3-methylhistidine is just an amino acid that is released by the body as a result of, of breaking down actinomycin. Okay, so we use that as a gross indicator. Now, watch the little fella. Is he going to work? Hey, there it goes, up and in. He gets it in the bowl every time, man, I tell you. So that's our amino acid. So it gets excreted by the body. It's not used for anything else. All right, so we use that as our marker. And as you can see here, the placebo group had a significant increase in 3-methylhistidine. All right, whereas my carbohydrate amino acid group actually had a decrease. So they were actually accruing muscle. They were building muscle and, uh, and retaining muscle as they went. Now, I must thank this bloke. All right. Um, he had to collect. We actually analysed these samples here, these sample pots. We analysed 3,500 of those. All right. So that is a little, yeah, okay. You get the point. Um, so suffice that the last session we presented him with his T-shirt and he was very happy. All right, so that's the part from looking at getting those acute changes over time. So it was concluded that carbon amino acid ingestion enhances muscle anabolism and by, through resistance training greater than independent consumption of either carbs or aminos. There was this synergistic effect on the two. Another paper which looked at this a similar phenomenon was that of Kirksick, um, specifically, who looked at, at 10 weeks of training. The groups had, uh, they ingested either a carb placebo, a whey or a branch chain, or a whey casein blend. So they had three, a whey casein blend, um, a whey uh, branch chain, or a carbohydrate. And what they actually showed was the group that ingested the, um, the whey casein blend had a significantly greater increase in, in body mass or fat and fat-free mass. Um, they had a 1.8 kilo increase in fat-free mass and a 3 kilo increase in, in body mass compared to the other, the other supplementation groups. And then finally, a review by Koopman, who actually looked at the effects of nutrition on promoting post-exercise uh, muscle protein synthesis, highlights the importance of protein and amino acid ingestion specifically. The authors outlined two critical points um, regarding protein and amino acid ingestion. Ingestion of protein amino acids during the post-exercise recovery period is most important for hypertrophy to occur. Okay, so we need to get an increase in amino acid availability. We need to get an increase in the interplay with insulin to allow the uptake. And that athletes need to ingest protein or amino acid to attain positive protein balance. So to go from a negative to a positive protein balance and accrue protein, he's suggesting in this particular paper that we need to ingest some type of, of protein. We've been doing that for years, and athletes have been doing that for a long time. But now it's all about the timing of ingestion looking at that nutrient optimization, which we said at the very, the very beginning. All right, so with that in mind, a few key points just to finish off with. So the, the scientific literature has shown that there's been a big increase in strength nutrition and research over the past sort of three to five years as such. Strength nutrition strategies are an integrated component that are integral with regards to influencing the pathway of adaptation model. Collectively, this research goes on to suggest four key points. The first, that the magnitude and the duration of the change in nutrient status determines the anabolic effects on muscle. So the magnitude and change of the, uh, the effects are going to be determined specifically uh, with regards to the nutri current nutrient status of the athlete. The second one is that inclusion of proteins with different digestive properties. Okay, so weigh and casein. If we look at those having different digestive properties, they will influence the postpartum period with regards to optimising my protein synthesis. So we need to consider that. 
The coordinated functions of metabolically connected nutrients. So if we look at that paper by Professor Kramer that looked at the multinutrient ingestion. Okay, they go on to promote further increases in the adaptive response. Uh, we had two of our honor students last year look at an, another uh, product that Masashi were, were establishing called Reactivate. Um, and we had one guy look at on-field rugby union performance. And the guys that actually took the supplement versus placebo had greater on-field match performance through notational analysis. So they had um, more sprints, uh, more, more contacts, more meters gained in a game. The second study we did with the Reactivate was looking at the acute hormonal profile. And there was a significant influence on the hormonal profile from a recovery perspective 24 hours after the exercise bout. And the final one is that obviously nutrient timing strategies are a must. Okay, they're an easy way to ensure that we're providing the right nutrients at the right times to allow for the adaptive response to be maximised. So four key areas that we need to look at addressing for our, our, our clients. Think about the four steps. Think about some key terms that we have with each of those steps. Think about the key terms you have for nutrient timing. And now you want to think about two key take-home points from what we've just discussed then. All right. So with that in mind, there's your pathway of adaptation model. Steps one through four all happen in one exercise bout. So in an acute exercise bout, we've got all this going on. Then it's the acute response that has happened over time, which gives me my chronic adaptation. So I increase in muscle hypertrophy, lean body mass, increase in muscle strength and strength expression. So with that in mind, final thing, back to where we started, 90, 60, 30. I want you two points with your partner, hit them with two key points that you got out of today, then they're going to give it back to you in 60 seconds, you're going to give it back to them in 30 seconds, and we're almost done. Okay, 90 seconds, where you go. Okay, we'll pull it up there. We're running sort of short of time. My extras group. Extras got the easiest bit at the end. So extras, two key points. What do you got? That'll be you guys down the front. Okay, great. So we want to look at my nutrient timing strategies. So thinking of these four particular areas related to nutrient timing. Fantastic. What else? One more. Okay, yep. So we want to look at leucine. So nutrient timing, obviously, is the key thing we want to get, and obviously the inclusion of leucine. Hope you can catch. Come on over. Oh, that's all right. All right, so four key points in the acute response. You've got your nutrient timing definitions. You've got some key points to take home with you. So with that in mind, what I want to do now, if you want to contact me, by all means, feel free to send me an email. I'm more than happy to have a chat to you about uh, this presentation or anything else. Just highlight a couple of things that you want to go see Matt. He'll be on the stand uh, this morning. So you can talk to him about his nutrient timing strategies uh, today as well as uh, Libby will be on the stand as well at some point so you can have a chat to her. But I'm more than happy now if we've just got time to take a couple of questions if there are any.